Special thanks to our promotional partners at the American Philatelic Society. The APS is the largest stamp collecting organization in the world, supporting collectors of any level worldwide. For more information about membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. Awesome. Hi, I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And I'm Charles Epting of HR Harmer in New York City. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. Now, Charles, um, this yes. is our second take doing this. First one would look a little bit different. Um, we tried doing it at the Spelman Museum uh, mm -hmm. in, a, in a rainstorm. Um, yeah. Now we're doing it in a snowstorm. <laughs> uh, at least yeah. for me, I don't know about, about you. But yeah, no, we, we got we, snow too. Did you? Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, we, we accidentally recorded this vertically instead of horizontally. So this yep. is us uh, trying to trying to rectify that error. Um, but it gives us a chance to, I think, sort of collect our thoughts and give a more, yeah. uh, uh, you know, fleshed out introduction than maybe we did standing in the rain that day. Yeah, yeah. We were just trying to kind of hurry through it because it was yes. um, it was pouring out. But it no. A I, blessing in disguise. So um, what we've got here is is kind of different from what we usually do. It's a, it's a two-part episode where at the Spelman Museum, uh, Noble Spirit hosted an event with Bill Crow, um, U.S. expert Bill Crow. Can I interrupt you really quick? Oh, please. For those of you guys who don't know, maybe you missed the episode with Joe Mullen that we did. The Spelman mm. Museum is one of uh, very few, maybe one of two museums in the country dedicated to stamps and postal history. It is located in Weston, Massachusetts, about 15 yep. minutes outside of Boston. Uh, it was founded in the early 1960s by Cardinal Spelman, uh, a, a, a Catholic cardinal who was also a, a very prominent stamp collector. So I didn't want to interrupt, but I didn't want people to be confused by no, what no, the Spelman Museum was. So. Thank you, because I, I um, you I go often there so often. Go. You assume everyone <laughs> knows. so often. Yeah, yes. I'm there like twice a month. So, um, but yes, no, so, so go ahead. We, we were really excited to put this on. It's the first time we've done something like this with, with an expertizer or an expert in stamps. We usually put on events for people kind of outside of the hobby and some collectors and stuff like that. So. Um, no, we were excited to do this first event where people would bring in material for Bill Crow to look at and kind of give an off the cuff opinion on whether or not it was genuine, what the faults were, if you should send it in, or if it was something you don't need to worry about. So um, this is an idea we kind of had a, a, a while ago, and it finally came together. And, and we're going to be doing a lot more events like these. But in the future, in, in, in May, I think it is, he's, he's putting on an event a similar kind of sponsored event by Noble Spirit at the Spelman Museum, where it's a presentation on how he uh, puts these opinions together, how he detects faults, flaws, everything like that. Um, so it, I, I'm just looking forward to, to seeing what people kind of, this is a four hour event that we've cut down to two hours. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, gaps <laughs> no it, what i liked about it, so i i drove up from new york i was about three hours from me door to door um i came up for the event uh which is how we filmed uh, an original introduction together right. because it was great to be able to connect and, and be there to support uh what you were doing and, and what i liked about it, it it was um uh very sort of free form people would come in mm -hmm. with their stuff it wasn't you know sit down for this block of time and uh you know be spoken to by by bill who's a wonderful expert it was more people drifted in and out people arrived with their couple of stamps to show off. And I thought it was fun that it sort of evolved over the course of the afternoon mm -hmm. um, rather than being any sort of, um, you know, fixed schedule. And I thought that was fun. Uh, you never knew what was going to walk through the door. So I'm excited to see how you've um, edited it down. I'm excited to relive some of it here. Uh, some of what Bill had to say again, uh, cause I really enjoyed myself. It was my first time to the Spelman museum. I had a blast and uh, just really excited that you were able to record it and, and love that you're putting these sorts of events on because I think this is a, uh, a wonderful direction to be taking things now that we can go back to having live right. in-person events again. Uh, you know, again, we love this. We love the Zoom thing, but being able to hang out with you and, and Kaylee and Olivia uh, at the museum in person was was real special. So um, no, I, I, I just commend you for doing this sort of work and I'm excited to sit back and uh, enjoy it all over again. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, without further ado, here is part one um, of this event. So far, it looks like we have mostly people who know what they're doing, so they don't need it. I had made up a list of useful websites okay. for collectors, 
and useful U.S. books for collectors, but so far I don't think anybody's going to need them, so since we don't have them here, it's... I can always send, if I get an email address, I can always send a PDF. Do you know the process by which individuals would contact either the Philatelic Foundation or the American Philatelic Society, what the nominal uh, fee might be? For okay, well, the Philatelic Foundation has a website. Right. Um, if you type in the Philatelic Foundation, you will get to their website. Uh, they do have a, you know, you'll do your usual clicking down, and they, they have one for expertizing, and you can print out a... Uh, a form. I, I believe their fees start at twenty-seven dollars. Okay. Uh, and that covers you a four hundred dollars catalog value, and then there is a percentage charge above the four hundred or whatever. It is. I, I don't. When I worked there, it was twenty-seven dollars. Basically, covered you up to five hundred and fifty dollars catalog value, and then the uh, five and a half percent fee kicked in after that. Is there a ceiling? Their, yeah, their ceiling now is like eight or nine hundred dollars, which, you know, it, it it really depends on the difficulty of the item. I mean, I've looked at items recently for some people. I, I looked at a uh, two cent Harding, mm -hmm. uh, six thirteen, which is very expensive, but there wasn't a whole lot to do. And it, it cats like sixteen thousand five hundred, and to, to charge somebody eight hundred dollars. To do that, I don't see it. Right. Now, the, the difference is Philatelic Foundation comes with a cachet. You put the you put the stamp up for sale at Siegel with a Philatelic Foundation certificate. It will get a much better price than if you put the stamp up for sale with my certificate. Yes. Um, I'm basically a one-man operation, and I can make mistakes, but I'm not... Like Siegel, in this day and age, Siegel accepts professional stamp expertizing certificates and the Philatelic Foundation certificates, and they really don't want to hear about anybody else, uh, which is fine. You know, that's their company, their prerogative. They can do whatever they want. So two questions are, is there a minimum floor that automatically, if it's found to be a counterfeit or not a valid stamp, uh, is there a fee that, that, that you charge or the others charge that it goes for the... Well, see, I have a different system which dealers love because I have what the coin people would call a reject fee. Um, I'll look at things. I mean, I've looked at things for Michael and for Tor, and basically they've been found wanting, and they don't want a certificate, so I have a minimum charge of like $3 okay. for, the, for the reject. It basically... It doesn't really cover my time, but it's sort of a, a, shall we say, a loss leader to get business as well. Do the others have minimum no. fees? Yeah, they do, $27. $27. And you're going to get a certificate whether you want it or not. <laughs> so the certificate will say it's fraudulent or it's right. counterfeit or it's, oh, I see. Yeah, well, for, for me, I would, well, in the case of uh, the one stamp down there, it was a, a Scott 93 as opposed to the 85B that you thought it might be. The, the 93 catalog is $55. It really doesn't need a certificate. Um, and that's a case where I'm an advantage. The foundation would give you the certificate telling you it's a Scott 93, and the, in reality, the certificate is probably worth more than the stamp when it's all said and done. Uh, I, I, try to, I do business with a lot of collectors who aren't sure what they have. Uh, they're looking to find out something. Um, and for them, I'm I'm very useful. But if you're somebody who's looking for <clears throat> high graded stamps that you want to try and sell, mm. PSC certificate is probably the one that's most accepted when it comes to grading, because uh, they started it. Yeah. And do you, get some, do you get submissions for grading as well as for? Yeah. Authenticity? Well, I will grade stamps if somebody asks me. I will give them a certificate. I will tell them what I think the grade is. The, such as like Tor will say, I don't want one with a grade of 80. I prefer ones with a grade of 85 or higher. Right. And that's fine. You know, I mean, I, I tell them what I see, and then the client tells me what they would like. So. Very good. And uh, how do we how do we reach you? What is what we uh, you know, tell us about your well, web page? Well, I do not have a website because <coughs> really at the moment I'm, shall we say, what I call my saturation level. 
Uh, there's only somewhat, I'm a one-man operation. I look at the stamps, I type up the certificates, I print out the stamps, I do the scanning. I mean, I do everything myself. <clears throat> and there's only so much I can do. Um, right now, I, I'm running around 2,200 actual certificates in the course of a year with probably at least another thousand rejects, uh, which is all a man can do. Yes, well, so. we're, we're, we're honored to have you. Uh, and uh, do you do sets as well as individually? No, uh, actually the tradition in the, in the stamp world has been to do just the individual stamps. I have once or twice done a complete set of graph zeppelins on one certificate, but it's not, if they're all original gum never hinged, that's fine. Uh, and it's easy enough to set. But then when you, if there's individual items which have a small problem, then it becomes more difficult with a, a set on a certificate. Though I think uh, Sergio might, does he do set? He does whole yeah. sets on a yeah. certificate, yes. Uh, it's but, more common in Europe. Right. Do the foundation doesn't do it, and the PSE doesn't do it, and APS doesn't do it either. Um, problem is most of the U.S. sets are not tight, hmm. shall we say. Like a set of Graf Zeppelins is tight. A, a set of Perf 11 for Washington Franklins is not tight. I mean, I can't even get the picture. On, I, I can barely get the picture of all the stamps on the back of the certificate. You know, that, that's the other problem. Or, or I can make it so small that you can't tell what, I'm, what, what you got certified. Um, so. And in terms of your uh, American? I only do U.S. I do U.S. only. I will tell you if I can't do it. Confederates? Oh, yes. Most okay. definitely. I like Confederates. Confederates. Um, you do Hawaii. And, uh, I, do, I, I do U.S. possessions. I do... Um, Ryukyu Islands? No. Okay. Uh, that, that is a... I have written enough Ryukyu Islands collections. I mean, I, I wrote up a couple for Harmers, um, and I can tell you that when you get into the chops, I don't want to know about them. Uh, there used to be a, a, a couple of guys... Well, was it Milo Rao? Uh, was one? Oh, he did only. Milo only did the Japanese occupation stuff. But there had been, there was another guy that could do the chops on the uh, provisionals. Right. Uh, the rest of, most of the rest of uh, the Raiko Islands is not difficult. It's that first beginning post provisional section, which is a real problem. Right. No, I won't do those. Yeah. Uh, I, back, back to the book? Uh, US back, I mean, I will do most <coughs> anything in U.S. <coughs> and if I say, if I run across something that I can't come up with an answer with, I will say I can't do this, and you'll get it back with no charge. Okay. Uh, I don't well, know how it's what, what, what's your favorite area, personally? And, and what do you find is the most complex and difficult area? And why is it complex and difficult? Well, I, I would say the one cent 1851-1860s is probably the most complex because it's been uh, parsed, for want of a better term, into so many tiny things. The three cent collectors will tell you that their stamps are actually more complicated and more interesting than the one cent, but the one cent boys got a really nice two-volume set written about their books, their stamps with nice illustrations, which made them more popular. Um, but basically, that time period is probably the most complex and most difficult. Um, you know, one of the things I get a lot of is it's got 64, pink. Mm. There's, shall we say, a lot of pretenders. Mm. Um, is this the pigeon blood pink one? Well, that's 64A. What Pid color is pigeon blood pink? Um, I haven't killed any pigeons recently. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're supposed to kill a pigeon. Uh, but not? it's really... Okay. Um... When I worked at the foundation, I found some notes in the Ashbrook files. Uh, this was a set of file cards that uh, Stanley B. Ashbrook had put together with pictures of items that he had seen. And in there was some correspondence between Stanley Ashbrook and um, Elliot Perry. And they were attempting to describe what is Pigeon Blood Pig based on the Ridgeway book. I don't know if you have a Ridgeway in your, your library here. Um, it is a book that was produced about 1912, okay. which was really designed for ornithologists 
so that they could identify the color of the birds that they saw in a tree someplace to someone who lived in a different part of the country. And so the, using that book, which is basically a series of chips, um, somebody produced an entire sheet and then cut it up into little tiny chips and pasted it into the book. They came up with two different colors in that book that they felt was pigeon blood. And I'm trying to remember the names. One of them, I believe, was Venetius Red, and the other one is a Corinthian Pink, I think. But mm -hmm. I, I, I have to look it up. <coughs> I own a Ridgeway. I have Ridgeways at home with the, with the information. But supposedly, based on Elliot Perry and Stanley Ashbrook, that's what constitutes a pigeon blood. Okay. Um, things like that, I, I talk of, uh, as communing with the ancients. You know, it's like... Uh, the stuff is, I, I believe that the foundation now has digitized much of the, the Ashbrook files, and it, it may well be in there. But there will be, uh, there's a lot of information in that. And you handle grills okay? Do they grill grills are, the 1867 series of grills is primarily not a problem. Um, they're usually nicely defined. If the banknote grills are more of a problem, but uh, yes, I can do those too. Okay, good. So. Good. So we've had a number of um, individuals already uh, come forward, and I didn't mean to interrupt your That's session, fine. sir. That's okay. Uh, but um, if uh, you wanted to, who, John, you've been taken care of, I think. <coughs> Marsha has left. Um, are you here, ma'am? Uh, just listening and learning oh. what I can. Okay. <coughs> so you're next, and come on up. Uh, Bill, what we were uh, saying to our members is that we would uh, hope that they might come with uh, uh, a number of stamps, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, three stamps or so, oh, yeah. and so that's what we hope will I've, happen. I've, I've copied what's in them. Mm -hmm. And so what are we looking at, Bill and uh, Michael and Kaylee? So we're looking at what Bill is looking at. Uh, yeah, about about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. By the way, did you want to uh, say a word or two? No, no, no. Okay. So this looks like based on the postmark that it's from Greenfield, Massachusetts. Correct. Yeah. Um, now, in this kind of condition, again, as I was explaining to the other lady, um, unfortunately, condition means everything. Sure. Um, but I'm pretty sure, off the top of my head, that Greenfield is not. A rare town marking okay. on the on these things. Um, I, mean, I live out in the area. That's the main reason I picked it up. So. Yeah. yeah. Now, where do you do your research on uh, stampless covers? Well, I, there is a book that um, okay. came out. There was a series of books that came out of, uh, a few years ago, which listed many of the town marks and put sure. an approximate value yeah, sure. on them. Yeah. Okay, so Greenfield, I guess the earliest samples covered that they had listed at the time was in 1812. Okay. Um, which you have... 1850? Right. That particular style postmark was used from basically 1841 to 1852 and has been has a minimal value in nice condition. I mean, sure. it had a, a, the books are a couple of decades old now, but they had a value of roughly ten dollars if it was in a brand new, crisp, sure. nice, sure. nice yeah. condition. Yeah. In shall we say faded condition, yeah. um, it, it's a nice thing to keep for your personal right. because you live yeah. near yeah. Greenfield. Right. But that from a collector's point of view. Mm -hmm. Given the condition, it doesn't have a lot of value. That's fine. And the, uh, I guess the other reason I bought it uh, was because it was addressed in Amherst, which mm -hmm. is where I lived. Oh, okay. And the name Morgan, I played golf with a gentleman with the last name of Morgan, so I didn't know if he was. No, is, he, so I have to, I have is to, his family? He's, the one that I played golf with, unfortunately, is from New Jersey. So oh, well, it wasn't, can't, uh, can't hold that against everybody. So, <laughs> but, uh, but he cut, uh, it was just, I found it very interesting mm -hmm. when I started on the uh, website and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Hadley is a little nicer. It, um, that one is 
what we would, it looks like it's more like a, a circular printed notice. Well, it is. That's exactly what. It, if you look on the inside, which I made copies here for you, but um, it's a, um, a letter from. Um, yeah, it's being dissolved. Right. Exactly. C C uh, C J J Ingersoll. And after doing some research on it, basically I found out that he uh, he owned the newspaper up there, and it sounds like from what I've been able to. Um, find out is that he sold the newspaper to Northampton Gazette, which is currently um, so business. own business there. And um, what he got, um, he bought another business down in New York somewhere mm -hmm. uh, as a printing uh, place. So he did a lot of printing and stuff. Mm -hmm. so. This is the same, the problem is most of the stampless markings mm -hmm. from the Northeast mm -hmm. are minimal value because there's a lot of mail to be found. Okay. Um, this is a nicer strike of the, of the postmark than when it's Hadley Mass. Yeah. Um, but again, it's not any. Sure. It, it's a nice thing to keep. Yeah. But no, no great value. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, this is. That's just the insert. Oh, okay. Inside, for the Hadley. Okay. okay. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Your, what was the name of that book uh, that you were uh, talking about that I would. <laughs> I wanted to look up some myself in terms of uh, the uh, well, they ought to have, um, they ought to have it. Well, actually, what's been going on in the U.S. Philatelic Classic Society okay. is in the process of rewriting the American Stampless Cover Catalog, mm -hmm. and I they may have done the Massachusetts section, but you can go to it okay. and go look in the Massachusetts section and see what the listings are. They're not putting values on things anymore. Sure, well, that's fine. What they're doing is sort of rarity factors. Yeah. The, what I have here is the last edition of the book that actually gave you prices, sure. uh, which is called the American Staples Cover Catalog. Okay. Now, where do you live now? I live in Amherst. In Amherst, okay. Yeah. So coming here would not be necessarily easy. Uh, no, I'm going to say it's probably a book that's in the Spellman's library. Right. So, well, I know that's when I joined the, the library last week. So, okay. um, my interest is in checking that out anyway. So, I'll right. probably go up and look around. Right, there. but they, they yeah. should have. There's, it's a three volume set. The first volume is all state related. Mm -hmm. Second volume is carriers, locals, steamboats, mm -hmm. railroads, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Third volume is telegraphs and some other miscellaneous things. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the first volume it covers the states. Yeah. Uh, but as I said, it's something that should be in the Spillman Museum. Mm. Um, it is. Okay. Great. Sorry. Do you, do you have a card at all if I want to I, do. I didn't come here to promote myself, but yeah. It's another opportunity to meet somebody. Right. Just, uh, has a, as Michael knows, I, I'm not big on self promotion. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. And your name is again? Uh, Doug George. Nice to meet nice you, Doug. Yeah. I can give you my uh, information. I have a uh, thing if you want. Okay. okay. Who's next? Next victim. Right here. <laughs> here I am. <laughs> what did you bring me? Museum has received uh, two items here with a uh, cache cover autographed by Mr. Henry Ford. Mm. So, I, I will tell you that autographs are not my field. Oh. Um, the only thing I could try and do is figure out whether it's an actual autograph as opposed to an auto pen. Right. So what would be the telltale factors of that? Um, consistency. Okay. Um, you know, if, if you've got three items and they're all 100% identical, like if you... Yeah. Did a scan and overlay, and they all came out the same. Chances are it's all the same. Mm -hmm. um, I would say this is a legitimate signature, but whether it's done by Henry Ford or not, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> because quite often for this sort of thing, we give it to our secretary, right. who does the signing. Mm -hmm. um, there are books uh, that will show you legitimate uh, signatures and give you a value, um, but I don't, own, I don't own one. Okay. Um, I'll put that one back. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm looking at here is, for, for one of it, anything else, at the end of Henry, 
there's an extra glob of ink. Okay. Which would say that there was an actual pen used to do this. All right. Very good. But as I say, whether it's... And, and that's like the problem with Abraham Lincoln. Yes. There are Abraham Lincoln signed by Abraham Lincoln, and then there are Abraham Lincoln signed yeah. by the secretary. Uh, and it makes a world of difference. Yeah. Wow. See, now this, I mean, it, this one may be okay, but there's a 100% consistency of ink as you go across, hmm. which if you've signed anything in ink, you would find you don't do it 100% across. Right. Um, it's a possibility. I, again, I am not an autograph person. There is a possibility that this one may be more like an auto pen than the other one. And then the final one from us is a uh, first flight of a Zeppelin. Okay. <clears throat> uh. I mean, this is not my field in the sense of, but it, I think it's one, it would be 100% legitimate. I mean, this sort of, it, it looks, it's an AC wrestler cover uh, who was involved in a lot of things. Actually, there's a new book out by Cheryl Gans, mm -hmm. which I have not gotten a copy of, but she talks about all of the Zeppelin flights, I think, in the U.S. And there's also the American Airmail Society, does a series of books um, listing values on various Zeppelin uh, items. I have not handled a lot of these. I mean, when I look at this, it's a legitimate cover. <coughs> I, I can't tell you what the value would be. Do you do United Nations? No. Uh, Autograph by Mark Chagall? If you say so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I wouldn't know. All right. Very good. Other questions people might have of, uh, well, we're waiting for others to come forward. How did you uh, become an expert? By looking at a lot of stamps. Yeah. Okay. And actually talking to people who had looked at a lot of stamps. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> when I first started going up to the Philatelic Foundation, their curator was a man named S. Kellogg Stryker, who, if you go looking back, Way back, you will find produced auction catalogs in the 40s of Kellogg and Stryker. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very knowledgeable. Uh, I had a chance to look at the Philatelic Foundation's reference collection, which was put together by Luff. Uh, and it's the important thing in trying to, to expertise is having seen items before, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to regumming. Uh, it takes a long time to find out what the gum is supposed to look like. Um, generally, if it's bright and fresh, chances are it's bright and fresh because it's new. Mm -hmm. um, it's. I started collecting probably about 1955 because my sister has started collecting and I couldn't bear to see my sister do something I didn't do. Uh, <laughs> Ultimately, I wound up uh, getting my father's stamp collection, which unfortunately he had stopped collecting when he discovered girls, um, which is not, a, not an uncommon problem. Um, so there were some okay things, and I think the oldest thing he had in there was a two-cent blackjack, uh, but that was about it. Uh, I, I asked him why he didn't buy the Graf Zeppelins, and he said that was at $4.55, that was far too much money for him. Um, <laughs> Because he was working in high school, he was do delivering um, um, telegrams for Western Union, mm -hmm. and he made a little money at that. But you know, money is a different world. I mean, at four dollars and fifty-five, that you can't conceive of what four fifty-five in nineteen thirty is versus today's yeah. money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Very so good. I, um, I graduated from. Actually, when I was in high school, I started working for the Minkus people, mm -hmm. who had a stamp department in Woodward and Lothar, uh, which is was near where I lived. Um, and I used to go there Christmas time, summer vacation, they let me work there. I, I graduated with a degree in aeronautical engineering at the, just the wrong time. Uh, talked to Sikorsky, said I was interested in flight test engineering. 
because I was fairly decent in vibrations in, in school. They said that's very nice. <clears throat> Where they used to make three helicopters a week, they now make three a month. Their next government contract started in three years. And I said, wow. Um, I discovered that in that world, you could have a job one day and go to work and find out you didn't have a job the next day. You then go home to your wife, your kids, and your dog and go scream. Like, what am I going to do now? I mean, I, I had a very good friend that graduated a year ahead of me who went to work for Boeing in their nuclear engineering department because they were going to help him get his master's in nuclear engineering. One year after he got, had, got there, there was no longer a nuclear engineering department in Boeing. Wow. And that was the way it is. So I said, I'm going to find something else to do that if I'm out of work, it's my fault and not something that's beyond my control. Mm -hmm. So I started working uh, in the stamp world. Uh, I worked for a dealer originally, uh, and then um, worked for Simmies in Boston. You, you old timers will remember Simmies. Right. I worked a few years there, and then uh, moved to New York. Worked in Stampazine on 57th Street, and that's when I got started to get associated with the Philatelic Foundation because they had a crew of professional people who came down on Thursday night to play poker, but they first spent an hour or two, or hour, an hour and a half at the foundation looking at the stamps that the foundation had. Mm -hmm. And they invited me to come along and I, I started looking, developed a relationship with one of the guys that was there, and sort of stayed associated with the foundation. How did you do with the poker? Uh, I never played, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I, <clears throat> last time I played poker was with Phyllis Molesworth, on a New Year's Eve, Jack was someplace else, and they started playing night baseball and all these other things, and I said, this is just not for me. Uh, I had a hand with four aces, real aces, yeah. and I lost. Oh. You know? <laughs> I said, this, is, this is just not a game for me. You know? so, yeah, yeah, what can you do? I mean, but that's saying, but in it, so poker is not a game. I well, poker's loss is our gain. Now, yeah. we actually have a, uh, a, our next visitor. Okay. Um, okay. Come on up, sir. And uh, your name? Ross Trosan. Uh, right on the spot? Right. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, <you're... laughs> I didn't know. They look real. Trial color proofs on blackjacks. Yeah, it was, I didn't know how to look them up in the catalog. Or... Okay, well, you need, you have a special, U.S. specialized catalog? I do. I have the 2020 version. Okay, well, let's see. I have an older version on here, but... And what catalog number are these? Uh, well, they're blackjack, so they're 73. 73. Okay, so what you want to do uh, really is go to the trial color section, I think. Or you go, let's, let's go to... The, okay. Yeah, okay, so play proofs on India paper. And they come in light blue, dull chalky blue, green, olive green, blue green, vermilion, scarlet, dull red, dull rose, and gray black. All of them were listed in the, the Scott catalog. You would go to the proof section. In the specialized. Okay. So, like for the orange ones, what would the, what color would that be considered? Um, vermilion. Okay, so it doesn't matter the shade. Well, yeah, I mean there are different shades listed. Okay, like there's a vermilion vermilion shade listed. There is a dull rose, is what I would call. Okay. Yeah. Those. See, like that's the stuff I don't know. <laughs> right. But they're all about the same catalog value. Okay. With the exception of what they have listed as a dull chalk, chalky blue. Um, in a blue green, everything else is listed at 250. Would, would that be a, a blue green? Um, possibly. Sure There's the green. green here. Uh, is that $2.50 uh, or $250? $250. $250. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, well, okay, there's, there is green, olive green, and blue green. Um, so this is where I need help. <laughs> we'll take a vote. <laughs> Well, I, to me, it's probably closer to green. Just straight um, up green. Yeah, now another place to, to look. Um, Jim Lee. I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with that. Okay. Jim Lee is a dealer from the Chicago area who deals in essays and proofs. Oh, okay. And sometimes on his website, he will have listed something like this blackjack in green or blue green or you know give you the ability to try and see the gradation differences um, I would tend to say that's green and not blue green but um, 
I'm not 100% sure. What's the catalog difference between green and blue green? Well, the green is green, green and olive green, which is, I, I will, I'm safe in saying this is not olive green. All right. Uh, so the choice is either green, green is two, 250 and blue green is 400. Um, and do the, the hint, I saw a hinge mark on the back of one, does that make any difference in the value? Uh, the concept and proofs? <laughs> Uh, as long as it's sound, I mean, you can soak that off. I see. Um, How would you do that? Yes. Uh, just I would do distilled water, and be careful of taking it out. Uh, proofs can be fragile. Sometimes yeah. it, it's just as well off to leave it on yeah. there. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so would you give an opinion on that if I sent it to you, or? Yeah. You would be, you would be able to. Yes. See so, now this one. Looks like it has either India fibers or it has a crease. Um, looking at it, when I backlight it, because these are India papers, yep. you will find white fibers of varying length, and they're usually they're short, but you can find a long fiber. If you put it in lighter fluid, it'll show up as a white fiber. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, Okay. Does that have a stamp? Lighter fluid? Does it? Does generally, no. Um, I, I've been using with classic U.S. It's usually not a problem. Um, there are stamps in the 20th century where it could be a problem because the ink is more fugitive, and the printing process is different. But the everything in the 19th century is engraved, uh, with the exception of, shall we say, some of the proprietary stamps which come. Bicolored, the center portion is not necessarily engraved. Um, you could have a problem there. One time, I I made the mistake of I was trying to take out some oxidation out of a stamp with the uh, one of the first issue proprietaries, and discovered that taking out the oxidation also took out about half of the the center vignette at the same time. <laughs> uh, fortunately, it was not a terribly expensive stamp, so it wasn't wasn't too bad. Um, you just a standard can of rosin out, maybe lighter fluid? That's yeah. Yeah. Which is getting difficult to find, actually, these days. <laughs> I mean, the last time I bought them, I wound up having to buy a case of 12 off of Amazon. Mm. But it used to be you could walk into CVS, which no longer yeah. handles it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Walgreens, I haven't checked recently. They did continue to handle it. There are fluids that they, they sell these days which are okay if you're trying to find watermarks on GB and some other things. They, sometimes they, they don't necessarily work well on U.S. stamps. Uh, big problem would be the uh, $1 Prexy, uh, which can have extremely light watermarks in it. And if it has a watermark, it's, it, you're in, in good shape. Uh, but I have found over the years that it's okay... Better is a, a thing called, I think, Zippo, which has no aromatics in it whatsoever, but it's well nigh impossible to find. Um, I used to be able to find it at a cigar shop in New York City. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, lighter fluid's a dying thing because people don't have lighters anymore. Right. They have butane, click, and, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. So I don't know what I'm going to use. I mean, when I first started in the business, one used benzene, which... Uh, <clears throat> Could take your breath away if you weren't careful, yeah. <laughs> and you'd sort of use a well-ventilated area. Is this uh, helpful to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is all interesting because I just use a standard watermark fluid, which I buy. You know, it's right. like fifteen dollars for a right. little one, but it's not, you know, flammable, which right. is nice. Right. <laughs> but is that not? Would that work on Indian paper? It should. It show it that should white work, fiber. It, would it, it show should. the same it, thing? It should. Basically, you're looking for a translucency in the paper, which is what the fluids cause. Um, but in, in, in reality, you could even use water because there's no gum. Um, and I've seen people do that. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> I've seen people do that with uh, banknote grills that are used. Uh, you know, you lay it on top of the water and you let the water soak slowly, and the points will start to appear. Hmm. Um, but the problem would be then you have to dry the thing, yeah. and then you have to make sure you don't press too hard because the points you might start losing points when you. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, so uh, the, the lighter fluid generally dries. The, the primary advantage of lighter fluid 
is that it drives at a pace that allows you to see faults, such as creases <clears throat> or what I would call a laminated tear, which basically is a slice in the paper, which will lay, when it's laid flat, you don't really notice it, but when it dries, it dries on two levels. And, oh, really? Okay. And, and also when looking at rebacking, uh, yeah. again, things start to dry on two levels, yeah, and that's, that a, would, that's that an indication that, that you have a problem. Great, great. And then you talked about trying to get oxidation out. You know, I know this has nothing to do with this, but that's, I do have a few, you know, orange okay. stamps that okay. seem like they're changing or, you know, they might be. Are they little, used or unused? Uh, generally unused. Unused, okay. What I do, I have a little black ceramic tray, which I lay a piece of screening across, you know, like the screening that would be used on your screen door or okay. something yeah. like that. I bought a chunk from a hardware store, cut it up, lay it, put the fluid in the tray, lay the screen on top of the, the tray, put the stamp on the screen, but don't cover it up. And just keep an eye on it. Usually about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, uh, should start to, it should start to show some change in removing the oxidation. What's the fluid that you're using, though? Um, hydrogen peroxide. Okay. Which is easily available at your local drugstore for about two bucks. Okay. Um, so it's how, it, how it's elevated a, is it off? Uh, about the, that much off. That, oh, okay, so it is yeah. a couple inches. And keep it well aired, then as the fluid evaporates, it, it will affect it. You start with your cheapest stamps first. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I do not immerse things in the fluid. I, I'm strongly against that uh, because a guy I worked for once upon a time had a Roosevelt book which had a, 90, I guess it's the 90 cent stamp of the small banknotes mm -hmm. which he wanted to try and do something with and he managed to take off a portion of the stamp with the Q-tip with the hydrogen peroxide uh -huh. in which case I have been, shall we say, loath to, to do any direct applications. So if it's a used stamp I will, I have a clamshell box left over from your takeout from uh, Bonefish Grill and <laughs> close it up and let it sit there. It's still on the screen. Still on the screen. But I will leave it closed up because what happens is if you do that and there's any gum on the stamps, if you leave it closed up, that it will start to affect the gum. Okay. Because it, the moisture will make the gum tacky, it will gloss it, it will change the texture. If you leave it just open air, um, chances are that it will not affect the color. And then if I do that and then say I, it was a more valuable stamp and I sent it to be expertized, would that be something that would be called out or would that be undetectable? I mean, at what point is it oxidized versus okay? Because it is a stage, right? Right. Um, if it looks natural, there's no reason really to, to say anything about it Yeah. in my world. I mean... I might, depending upon what the item is, I might put it underneath my ultraviolet lamp and see if the, any drastic change has occurred. But if it looks natural, then no, I wouldn't say anything about it. Okay, good. Oranges are, are b the biggest problem. By far, yeah. Yes. It would, and it's, and it's, five cent 1847s also run into that problem as really? well. Okay. Um, it, sometimes it's difficult to tell what the true shade is until you do a little work. Well, yeah, there's, there's about five shades, right, for that? There are five shades listed in the Scott catalog. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are far more than that, but that's what Scott is chosen to price. Gotcha. Um, but there are many shades because it, it was a, again, it's a workhorse stamp that yep. is printed over four or five years. They change the mixture every so often. You know, different weather conditions. The summertime you'll get one mixture, the wintertime you'll get a different <laughs> mixture, you know, so the things do change over a period of time. So. All right. Okay. So I, I will say that Excellent. The, the most commonly abused um, color on 5747s is orange, or red orange. And what a lot of people don't understand is the red orange is a function of the wear on the plate that the red orange usually comes as an extremely warm impression so that the ink didn't really take and it's like a, a thin veneer across the stamp 
it makes it a little more translucent. And I, I see a number of items submitted as orange, which are great impressions, which means it can't possibly be because it's the wrong printing. There are, there was a two volume or two part series in the Collectors Club Philatelist written by Calvin Hahn, where he talked about the different printings and the different shades associated with printings, because you'll find certain shades are associated with like two or three different prints. Right, right. And he tried to illustrate in that article uh, the different printings in different colors. Now it's, again I presume you guys have a run of the Collectors Club Philatelist? I'm sure we do. <laughs> okay, so you should be able to find the article here and take a look at it. I mean I, uh, I scanned it and, and put it on my computer as a, as a guide once upon a time. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, it, that can sort of give you an idea of the kinds of colors that are available in the 5747s. Yeah, yeah, interesting. All right, this has been great. Thank okay. you very much. And your Thank name you. is again? Rob Trepasani. Trepasani. Okay. Trepasani. Okay. Nice to meet you. Thank you. you. Nice to meet you. Bill, Bill, can I just ask you a general question? Sure. Um, I, I've asked if this of other people, and I get different answers all the time. But, you know, a stamp is only worth if there's a, a buyer out there. You know, the Scott catalog. <laughs> Do you feel that, generally speaking, it's the prices in that are overinflated by X percent, Y percent? What, what's your gut feel? Where are you talking? U.S. stamps. U.S. stamps. If you read the catalog, it tells you that the price is for a stamp in very fine condition. So, in very fine, a sort of a fungible term. Uh, but, and again, like if you went to... PSE's website, uh, gradingmatters.com, they have what they call SMQ, Stamp Market Quarterly. If you, if you look at that, it will say that a very fine stamp, which is their grade of 80, is, has a value which is about the same as the Scott Catalog value, which is theoretically the retail price for that stamp. And if it's of a higher grade, you know, better centered or better, better looking, it would have a higher value, and if it's got problems, it's going to have a substantially lower value. So it's just like an arbitrary midpoint, I, I guess would be the best way. Would you say that, Michael? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so if you have an off-center stamp with a hole, chances are it's not even <laughs> worth 5%. Yeah. Um, that sort of stamp the dealers would often call as a catalog builder. You would put it in your collection so that you could add it to the total final value of catalog <laughs> value that you... Uh, present the, the uh, collection is happening. Well, we might call it a filler, so... Uh, well, you call it a filler. <laughs> yes, it's a filler, but to the dealer who's selling the collection, it becomes a catalog bill. Yeah, you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have uh, next gentleman, I think, in the back, sir. Were you here for uh, a stamp? Yes. You're next. And then I think it was Mark, and then Heidi, I think, was... Uh, uh, the I have a stamp or two. <laughs> Bill, who does? Person. Yes. Who has a stamp or two? Oh, you have a stamp or two, okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, Recoming. Yes. Well, what is the seat. number one telltale <coughs> sign that a, gun, that, a, that a stamp has been recombed? It looks We're wrong. We're looking at the purse or the, the gun. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it looks wrong. Yeah. It yes. looks wrong. Um, it, it, again, when you're looking at dollar value Colombians, hmm. after a while you begin to, and even dollar value transits, after a while, the, you begin to see that there is a certain look to a genuine um, original gum stamp. There'll be certain lines that you'll see, a certain pattern. Um, often, you can look at the perf tips, and you will discover that the glue has sort of wandered its way into the perf tips. Now, one of two things have happened. It's actually regummed, or it's been treated poorly. Hmm. Is there uh, ever a case where... Soap gum tips are original. Yes, I was about to say, plastic mounts are a killer of gum, uh, especially if you are in a warm, humid area. The um, the gum can flow into the into the perforation tips based on moisture. You know, it's softened. It's been up against something, and yes, you can have. You are correct. I have a question regarding the Colombians. Yes. Once in my youth long time ago, I was told that on the Colombian issue, five or six different types of gum were used. That's entirely possible. Again, as we were discussing on the, uh, the classic stamps, you know, it depends on what time of year it was gummed. Um, 
Yeah, the, the, it's less so on the dollar values because the printing quantities are smaller. But on, say, like the one cent Colombian, of which probably they did a couple of billion, uh, there will be different types of go, yes. So. Okay, go ahead, sir. Hi, I'm Joe Zek. Nice to meet you, Joe. Bill Crow. Hi, Bill. Okay. So what I have here are, is the um, 12 cent Franklin. Copper ring. That's supposed to be perfed 11 by 11. Mm -hmm. And this is um, 11 by 12. Uh, faked quite a bit. Uh, that's the first strike. And I bought it on eBay, so that's the <laughs> second strike. <laughs> <laughs> What you have is a stamp that had a straight edge once upon a time at the uh, top, mm -hmm. which has been given a new lease on life. Uh, <laughs> somebody has reperfed it. Okay. They gave it. A, they gave it a perf twelve, but it, the other three sides are perf eleven. You know, absolutely fine. The the top is, and you can tell by the blood tip straight across. It yeah. was straight at one point. The holes are all nice and round and smooth and circular as you go across, which is another coup de gras for perforations. You, in the Washington Franklin time period, if you get things that are perfectly round and perfectly smooth as you go across, its chances are extremely high that it's reperfed. Yeah. Okay. And the other stamp I have is a three cent uh, Washington banknote that is supposedly printed on both sides. Oh yes. I'm not an expert on this particular. Okay, number one problem. When it's printed on both sides, yes, it reads correctly. This is reverse. Yes. Okay, so it can't be printed on both sides because you can't print in reverse. Okay. Because when that's the correct way, there's no way to print it in reverse on the other side. What it is is the stamp was laid on top of another sheet that still had wet ink and when it was laid on top the color of the sheet below it was transferred to the back of this stamp. It's a great, what they would call an offset and it's, you know, it's, it's very nice but it is not printed on both sides. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. I mean it's a nice curiosity piece and it is collectible with people. People would buy the stamp with the with the, a full offset of the reverse. Many times you only see a partial or small. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Z. Thank you kindly. Nice. Uh, gentlemen, and, uh, sir, we, I think you were next. Who? You? Really? Um, I had others in front oh, of me. Oh, was there anyone? Heidi, go <laughs> She's been patient. Heidi, all right. Hi, Mr. Crabb. We're with you in just one Sure. Second. Okay. Give me the water. I have a better look at. Oh, right here. Perfect. Sure. Okay. So my name is Heidi Price, and I. Heidi. It's nice to meet you too. So like you, I inherited my father's collection. Good. But my father continued to collect after he discovered ladies, unlike your dad. So I do a little work here at the museum, so I'm learning. Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about stamps, but I wondered if you know what those are. I've come across those in my travels here. Well, it looks like one perforated proof. The Similar to the one that uh, John showed me earlier, mm -hmm. the this particular stamp, what has been done over the years, because it was reissued in 1875 without a grill, um, shall we say nefarious people later in life would uh, get a hold of the proofs, and there were card proofs that were made um, about, I think, in 1875 also in conjunction with the celebration of the uh, 100th anniversary of the United States, which uh, was held in Philadelphia in 1876. Mm -hmm. uh, stamp dealers and, and other people would get a hold of the card proofs, they would shave them very slightly, and then perforate them and gum them and say, you have a reissue, mm -hmm. uh, which is fairly uh, scarce. I'm just going to double check one thing to make sure that I'm not telling you Wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that lighter fluid that you? Yeah. Can no. I don't know if you, you can see. You, you can't really see it in there. What I'm trying to, to sh it probably gets out of focus. Perfect. What I'm trying to show is that there's a certain unevenness mm -hmm. in the backing, yeah. mm -hmm. which is standard with shaved card proofs. 
because it's very rare that they go they get right. it completely flat that usually there's a telltale and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. a certain unevenness a darkness here a lightness there mm -hmm. um, which gives you a tip off uh, the, the other one from again this is we were talking before about experience just looking at the perfs and going these are not right mm -hmm. followed by this is not really the shade that I associate with the, with the reissue because mm -hmm. um, there's basically only one shade with the reissues mm -hmm. So what would be the value of that stamp, in your opinion? Um, as it is, <clears throat> minimal. Um, if you found a collector who likes to collect uh, forge proofs, I mean, I, I have a whole raft of them. Um, but basically, it's minimal. Mm -hmm. It has no real value. Mm -hmm. OK, now the, the 10 cent stamp, I have to do a little work on that one, I believe is what's called Scott 34, which is one that has a, um, a recut line at the top. Mm -hmm. It comes, there's eight different positions. Mm -hmm. It comes recut at the top, recut at the bottom, recut at top and bottom. Mm -hmm. um, so let me go here. One of the things I've done over the years is I <coughs> secured scans of all eight positions mm -hmm. so that it's... Uh, Handy. Yeah. So I need to call those up and take a look. Go on. Section. Does the stamp have a red ink cancel? Um, yes, uh, it is. This is probably. Um, what we call either a New York exchange mark or a New York transit mark. The red on the classic stamps is typically because it's going through the foreign, foreign office and they've marked it with red to show that the proper postage has been paid to wherever it's going. <clears throat> ten cent stamps like this could be on the cover to Germany uh, because it was a, a standard ten cent rate at one point. Uh, there are a number of different rates um, there's a 21 cent rate to France from the U.S., which would have two 10 cent stamps and a one cent stamp. Um, so yeah, it, it's some sort of exchange mark. Without saying the entire marking, it would be difficult to say exactly. It, it looks like um, a New York paid, which would be an exchange mark. And does that add value to the stamp? Uh, it can. It can. Uh, it depends on how nicely it's struck. Uh, it doesn't. It's certainly not a negative. Uh, because the, the typical one is is black as opposed to uh, oh I know why I'm not getting in place I don't have I don't have my hard drive hooked up to this uh, which has got all the information that's okay um, but I, I would say that from the looks of things I, I, I can't tell you which position it is but it, it looks like it should be a Scott 34 the imperforated and the perforated are all the same positions. Mm -hmm. So they have a, the same uh, recut line and it's not but this is three. Yep. Try and show you what I'm talking about. Oh wow. So up here, this is position 3R, mm -hmm. but there's your recut line up here which mm -hmm. also has a little tiny telltale there. Mm -hmm. And there are I go across. I wish other people could see this. This is really yeah. kind of cool. I don't think anybody can see this. Uh, but it's the kind of thing that I use. You're getting there. Oh. See, oh. keep going, Heidi. <laughs> yeah, keep coming. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is getting good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, okay, that, that's the kind of thing that I use in, in trying, to, trying to expertise. Is basically, I've copied pictures from Siegel and from the foundation of each position that I can blow up and take a look and to make sure that Very cool. it has the right appearance to the recut line because there are cases where people take a stamp and, shall we say, give it a, a new lease on life with a, <laughs> an extra line, and it's not always right. I mean, I have mm. seen <coughs> stamps. Sometimes you can, it, it's easier to tell underneath the UV lamp because the underneath the UV lamp, the color of the recut line might fluoresce differently than the rest of the stamp. 
um, which is not good. Uh, it, it should fluoresce the same because it's printed at the same time. Right. Mm -hmm. So let me go see what else I can find here. See. Yeah, for an old guy, I, I think I'm fairly digitally... Fluent. Fluent. We're impressed. <laughs> <laughs> We're a bunch of paper people around here. <laughs> well, I bought my first computer in 1980, um, which was an Apple II Plus. Yeah, hey, you were ahead of the curve. Yeah. Well, no, actually, I was even more ahead of the curve because I had a North Star, which was a full, had a hard disk, it had a full 64K of memory. <laughs> which was uncommon at that time, and a and a 15 megabyte hard disk drive built into it. Um, you couldn't hardly find things like that, and it was like about four thousand dollars at the time. <laughs> twenty mega, twenty megabyte hard drive. <laughs> no, fifteen. No, fifteen. Yeah, no, I had a what was called an apricot, twenty megabyte. Okay. Sixteen thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I mean, what I can do on this computer. This man invests in his work. What I can do on this computer, which I paid a couple thousand dollars for maybe five years ago, people in 1980 would have killed for. <laughs> I mean, basically. NASA would have killed for. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what are we looking at here? So what are the options that you're looking at, Bill? It's uh, perf or imperf. It, it's a, this is uh, a 34, Scott, um, the 10 cent perforated. What I, I look at the imperforate only because it's a lot easier to, perforations don't get in the way of the, of the recutting, uh, which can happen on the perforated stamps. What's the value differentiation? Um, Generally, they, well, the the perforated are worth more than the imperforate because they're less common. Um, catalog value on this, I think, is around um, it's in the seventeen hundred to two thousand category. Oh, nice. Take a week and off the, work. This is imperf. <laughs> what is the perf? No, the perf is like uh, the imperf. I think is like around thirteen, fourteen hundred, depending upon whether it's both recut both top and bottom or recut one of the other positions. The uh, perforated are higher. Higher. Okay. Did you know that coming I didn't. in? That I did not. That's yeah. helpful. We'll keep it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a slight condition problem in the sense that it's missing some perforations at the upper left, which would it's minimize, it will, will cut into the actual the value. value of the item. Mm -hmm. Is I think the closest right now. I mean, I would have to work on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so bring this down. Well, would you suggest that we s submit it for the actual authenticity, the actual? That, that's up to you. Okay. So what I'm looking at this is position I think this is a museum. This okay. is a museum <laughs> stamp, is it? Yes. Okay. okay well, then can everybody see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so that's position 86, and this is the recut line across the top here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's helpful. Yeah. And nice. there's some recutting. Let's see. Well, there we go. This is with my finger. Mm -hmm. There's a little recutting here, mm -hmm. and a little bit there where they've they've increased it. So the museum owns this. Yes. Okay. Well, then. There will be an accommodation. Thank you. <laughs> 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 we treat it appropriately. Yes. <laughs> Great. Okay, so onward. This one made, made it to Europe once upon a time. Oh, wow. Because it has a European signature on the back. It looks like it might be ADM. Um, in, in any event, this is. I'm not sure about the gum, but this this particular stamp I don't have to, is the 90 cent stamp of 1860, which is worth more used than it is unused mm. Uh, mm. because not that many. Been? Well, no, because not that many were were actually used. The stamp mm -hmm. came out like September of 1860. Mm -hmm. Would have been only in use for less than a year before everything changed because of the Civil War. They mm -hmm. they, they dropped the old they 
demonetized the previous stamps and then came out with a whole new set of stamps. So, and it's 90 cents stamps are really only use, useful in heavy packages mm -hmm. uh, because, like, the postage rate to Europe at that time, if you're going to France, is 15 cents for a quarter ounce. Mm -hmm. Going to England, it would be about 24 cents for two quarter and a half. Mm -hmm. um, so, to use 90 cents, you're going to have to have something that's thicker than normal. Sure. Okay. sure. The gum, I'm not 100% sure on this one. Um, it may be okay. This maybe has endured a little heat, which caused it to flow a little bit, but otherwise it's okay. Mm -hmm. And this particular one is the ninety cent, uh, the one cent stamp of the eighteen sixty one series, which mm -hmm. unfortunately looks like it's been reperforated at the right, the left. Um, it, it's not an expensive stamp to start out with. It, it catalogs like forty five dollars. Mm -hmm. um, Joe, would something like that have been donated just from a collection? Could, sure, it is. Yeah. yeah. Also has a tear at the top. Oh. <laughs> Those things happen. You know, been around a while. Yes. But, well, that's it. I mean, if you were 160 years old, what kind of shape would you tear. be? I have a tear. No question. <laughs> <laughs> but the 39 was um, didn't have any faults, really. No. At, at first glance, I would say no. I mean, I haven't put it in fluid or anything like that. It, it, okay. It was hinged. Mm -hmm. This particular stamp, um, if you want to show, this one comes in a several different shades which are supposedly highly desired. Mm. Uh, well, I brought some of my reference collection with me in case I got into a, a dicey question. Could happen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What well, I was going to try. Like, this shows you some of the, the different shades that the stamp comes mm -hmm. in. Uh, what I really wanted to show is one of the... That's helpful. That's what we need to see. No shades. Now, this is a shade that often gets misidentified. You can put it up there. Yep. That's dark blue. Mm -hmm. And I see, that's something I see a lot of. A lot of people submit the dark blue shade, which is not dark blue. Um, there we go. Yeah, you can see the difference. Mm -hmm. And Very neat. This is a slightly little. This is a lesser example. I kind of juxtapose mm -hmm. this. Now this was certified by um, the one in your left hand was certified by professional stamp uh, auth authentication grading as the dark blue. Yeah. The one in your right hand was one that I compared to Jim Lee's collection of one of, of dark blues, and he said he was happy with that one as a dark blue. <laughs> Interesting. The funny thing is, I bought really this. Really helpful to see this. Well, that's reference collections. Yeah. I mean, Very that's cool. that's that's why I build them um, because helpful. you can't you, you cannot expertise basically in the dark. I mm. mean, it's like you, you need something to compare to. Right. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So Very interesting. I would say <coughs> if you want a certificate on the two of them, you talk to Michael. Uh, All right. For the museum. You know, price would be zero. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.